Hey, beautiful soul. Welcome to Spirit Speakeasy. I'm Joy Giovanni, joyful medium. I'm a working psychic medium, energy healer, and spiritual gifts mentor. This podcast is like a seat at the table in a secret club, but with mediums, mystics, and the spiritual luminaries of our time. So come behind the velvet ropes with me and see inside my world as I chat insider style with profoundly gifted souls. We go deep, share juicy stories, laugh a lot, and it wouldn't be a speakeasy without great insider secrets and tips. You might even learn that you have some gifts of your own. So step inside the spirit speakeasy. Hey, beautiful soul, welcome back or welcome in for another episode of Spirit Speakeasy. I'm so excited to be with you today. For those of you that are new, I'm Joy, Joy Giovanni, Joyful Medium, and today we are going to do another one of our Ask a Medium Anything episodes. I am going to do a quick little share. You guys have said that you like me sharing a little bit about what's going on and what I've been up to at the beginning of the one-on-one episodes that we do. I just want to remind you as well that we do have the free community healing just around the corner. If you're listening to this episode the week it's released, uh, the healing is next week. So it's September 19th, 2024. If you want to check that out, learn how to get the Zoom link, I do them live on Zoom, just go to my website, joyfulmedium.com, and you can just look in the events tab, the events section of the website in the drop down, and you will see the dates, you'll see all the info, you'll see how to sign up, and I send out the links directly into your email inbox, and then we are live together on Zoom for Reiki, transmedium healing, and just general energy healing. Uh, So you're welcome to come to that. I would love to see you there. I'm actually recording this episode pretty close to when it's being released. I had planned to record it a little bit earlier in the week, but I um, got busy writing episodes. So I actually know some of the upcoming episodes. And I wanted to let you guys know, everyone's been really enjoying the Healing with the Angelic Realm episodes, so I wanted to let you know that we will have two more of the Healing with the Angelic Realm episodes before the end of the year. We'll have one coming out in just a couple of weeks and then one a little uh, a little closer through the holidays. So get excited for those and keep your eyes peeled. Uh, and you guys have been continuing to submit questions by email, which I love, and I've continued to collect them. And sometimes there are repeat questions where, you know, people will have same or very similar questions or questions as the answer is kind of the same. So I compile those and kind of crunch them down and make our list of questions. And we'll get through as many as we can, but We've done two previous Ask a Medium Anything episodes, and if you haven't checked out those, your answer might be there, because I'm trying not to repeat information and give the same questions and answers each time, so I will link those in the show notes, Um, but they're called Ask a Medium Anything. I think one of them is part one, and part two, this would be part three, so just know you can go and find those. If you're not hearing the answer to your question here, it might be there. So... I've compiled our list. We'll get through as many as we can. Keep sending the questions. Uh, You can just email them directly to me, joy at joyfulmedium.com, and I will put them into the pool. So our questions for today, I'm going to start with the question, what is the purpose of mediumship? Which is a really big question. Uh, I thought quite a bit about this. I mean, there are some obvious answers for me that just might not be obvious to everyone. For me, and it's not to say these are the only answers, because I think we could create a lot of of purposeful reasons. Um, But for me, there are three main purposes of mediumship, at least the type of mediumship that this is that we're talking about, which is evidential mediumship, which we'll talk about more in just a minute, uh, which essentially is communicating, connecting with, sharing details and um, information and sometimes messages from loved ones who have already crossed over to the spirit world. So that's the type of mediumship we're talking about. There are lots of types of mediumship. Uh, But for that type of mediumship, for me, it really boils down to three central purposes. Um, The first purpose to be 
I'm going to kind of work these. I, I don't want to say like in order of priority because that's not correct. Probably in order of like simplest, like base meaning, um, and then we'll go there. There's only three of them. So this first, this first meaning for me or purpose of of mediumship is really kind of the base purpose, right? Like what are we doing? What are we doing there? How do you know if, if a session was quote unquote successful? It's to show that the soul continues on just in another way. So that can be validated a lot of reason, a lot of reasons or ways. It can be them um, communicating details about themselves or their life or things going on in your life, memories that you shared. Uh, there, there's so many ways that they can validate it. But really the purpose of mediumship at the very, like in the session base level is to, to show, or some people like the word to prove that the soul continues on just in another way. There's a lot happening in a session. Um, even just, you know, in this degree that we're talking about, because your loved one has to get you to a medium. First of all, they are organizing that and nudging you. And sometimes when it's like that thought on the back of your mind for a while of like, oh, maybe I should search up a medium, or maybe I want to Maybe I want to see how this works. Maybe I want to find out about a group reading. That little kind of tickle in the back of your mind, that's your loved one trying to get you into a medium most of the time. Um, so they have to do that. They have to know when you're going to be there so they can be there as well. So that proves that they're with you. They have to, you know, work with the medium and, and that typically involves them doing additional work because they would have been learning to communicate with that individual medium for a while before the session. So uh, it's part of why I sit in meditation to give them an opportunity to kind of work in my energy and learn how to work with me. Uh, if you listen to the guide episode as a medium, that's one of the things our guides help us with. So they're already doing a lot of work before the session. And then when they come to the session, they're working with the medium to try to get me, I'll speak for myself, as close to what they need to communicate or want to communicate as possible, they know how to identify themselves to you. So we all are different in the different relationships in our lives. And if I crossed over to the other side, um, I would communicate and come through to my best friend in certain memories and certain aspects of my personality, but someone like one of my kids, for example, I, I would come through very differently because I'm a different aspect of myself with different people. So they have to know their relationship with you. They have to have all of their memories. There's an intelligence that they're working with. So really it's all of those elements together. And then when your medium is expressing details about them, it's your loved one communicating those things to show that they're actually present, that their presence is there with you in the room and that they do spend time with you and that their soul continues on just in another way, that you haven't lost them. They're just not physically present, but their soul is present. It's just that we, you know, we don't experience them in a physical body anymore. So that is the first thing that is the purpose of mediumship. The second piece of it is healing. I mean, the the truest, deepest intention, so this is kind of going like the next level deeper for me below the surface, is it's the purpose of healing. Sometimes it's the healing of the person on the spirit side. They have something that they um, understand now that they didn't understand when they were here. They understand an emotion differently, perhaps. They feel responsible for something. They want to let you know that they're okay. They want to unburden or lift your heart in some way way. So it could be healing for them. It could be healing for you or for someone else that's here in the physical world. Um, maybe there's something that, you know, you just really need to know for sure, as sure as you could be, that they're still with you to unburden you just a little bit more as the recipient when you go in. So it could be healing for you. It could be healing for a situation in the family. But, you know, all of these different aspects of healing are one of the truest, deepest purposes of mediumship communicating with the loved ones. So there's so much healing that comes out of sessions and sometimes and often there's a ripple of healing because we process 
kind of slowly, right? As humans, our emotions, even though sometimes they feel really fast, we move through them kind of slowly. They're a little bit dense, especially if it's tough emotions like grief or loss or, um, you know, challenging relationships that we may have had with someone in the world. Those emotions take time for us to process. So yes, you receive information, messages, um, some version of, of uh, proof or showing that there's their presence was there, even to a degree, even if you can't accept it fully, it's just opening your mind and heart that much more, um, even if it's 1% more. So it's really the intention of, of helping you know them and us on this side in our healing journey. Um, a little interesting side note is as a medium, I end up getting quite a bit of healing out of the sessions as well. Partially just getting to spend time in that energy is... Uh, wonderful. And partially, you know, I'm, I'm an emotional being too. So sometimes um, I will be shown in my own mind's eye, a, a snippet of a memory of my life. And, and even though it's that person communicating with their loved one, who's my client, um, you know, sometimes there's, there's some understanding for me to be had about things in my own life. And certainly, <laughs> certainly personal development, anyone that's studied mediumship or spiritual work to any degree, uh, we get a lot of personal development. So healing is the, the second main purpose of mediumship. The third purpose is kind of a, a an additional part of the healing, I guess, but for me, it feels like a third part. It's really to help us live more fully now. Um, so often, loved ones are sharing regrets from the other side. It's not all of the time, but I do frequently have someone expressing through the communication that maybe they really um, didn't have an easy time expressing their emotions. Maybe they were someone who came off as cold or distant or harsh, but really they they loved their family so much. So sometimes the regrets will be around the way they did or did not express their emotions or express themselves. Um Sometimes the regret will be around the things they didn't do, not the things they did do, but the things they didn't do. It will be, um, you know, not mending the relationship with their best friend, not uh, taking the trip that they always wanted, not, um, you know, not laughing at the little things, being too serious. Uh, there's, I mean, a million versions of it I think we can come up with, but sometimes um, and often part of the, it's not like an overt message necessarily. Sometimes it is, but more often it's one of these like messages in the background. I feel like the messages are all layered through the communication. So it's not like, you know, very free, very rarely at the end will I say, and this is the message. It's the message is really woven throughout the communication. So sometimes just in them identifying, oh, when I was you know, in the world, I was like this, and now I understand this. And, and it's, it is them in a subtle way saying like, oh, I, I didn't have to do it that way. And sometimes they'll say that, like, I, I, I realize I could have been different. I could have had permission to do that job I wanted to do. I could have had permission to, you know, marry or divorce the person that I was with. Do you know what I mean? Like there's, there's so many Regret's not probably even the, the exact right word, but so many uh, times they're expressing this wisdom of um, realizing how they could have done bits different. And it, it often stems from either personal development, like emotional healing, like something that was challenged in their emotions or in their personality as a person, or it comes from a fear-based place, afraid to, you know, take a bus or a train or a plane and and see something they wanted to see, afraid to um, explore their spiritual gifts sometimes, a afraid to, I don't know, challenge themselves in some way. So sometimes it comes down to fear at the end of it, you know, at the end of the like, why didn't I do that? Or, or why did I hold myself back? But they share those things in an effort to kind of free us in some way and remind us, help us, show us, display it through their own life experience that um, we can live more fully now. We can be like, be more of your true self is really what it is. Be who you are, express who you are, um, 
tell people when you love them, call the person who's on your mind, or at least just shoot them a text thinking of you. Uh, these connections and relationships and the love really is what continues on. So that's the third piece of it for me is, is yes, this healing, this unburdening, this lifting us in some way often, but also, um, you know, helping us to, to just live more fully now to kind of let the small things go and work through the tough things and, you know, have the relationships and, and the life and move towards things fully now and express ourselves fully, you know, now if possible. So those are essentially the three purposes of mediumship. Now, Another really common question has been, what information should I provide for the medium? Like if I'm booking a session and I'm going to go see a medium, what information should I plan to provide them? Uh, this is an interesting question, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer it in a couple different ways. But I do want to just, as a blanket statement, throw out there, everyone works differently. Um, I'm not here to throw shade on anyone else's work. I do have the styles that I prefer and and my own reasons for that. Um, but I'm there are lots of types of mediumship. There are lots of types of readings. Uh, there are lots of styles of mystical and spiritual work. So I'm going to speak for myself. <laughs> um, my personal opinion in the style that I work in currently is that you shouldn't have to provide any information for the medium. Uh, when someone books with me, for example, they fill out basic information, their name, um, an email address because they need a confirmation and they need me to send them the, you know, the reminder, the address, the Zoom link, whatever it is. Um, I do like a phone number because if someone you know, like forgets or if there's an emergency and I would need to call them to cancel the appointment. It doesn't happen often, but it has happened in, in the years of um, me being in private practice. So I like a phone number. What else do I like? Um, yeah, they really don't have to provide any other information. And the truth is I've had people use aliases, like not their real name or a nickname or their sister's name and a new email address that's not attached to them in any way. So you could do that if you if you felt it necessary for you to feel extra comfortable. Um, yeah, technically, I don't even really need their actual name, but I need somewhere to send the confirmations and, and all of that. So um, yeah, nothing is, I guess, the very basic answer. You shouldn't have to give them any information. Uh, however, I will say that I I know mediums who like the person to bring in items and, and do something which is called psychometry, which is holding an item and using that to either experience information or foster a, a connection with the other side. So there's lots of ways to use objects of the person. Um, I've had people bring objects. I've had them bring in just like the object. And then I've had them bring it in like an envelope or a box or something. Um, I, to be honest, I would prefer not to see the object because my mind is so active and my human mind immediately gets anxious when I see an item or a box or a, cause I, I feel like I need to figure it out. That's not the way mediumship works. The, the spirit side shares with me if they need to about this item or, and I don't personally, I don't, often work with items to like help me um, or foster connection with the other side. Some people like to, some people like working that way and it's a cool way to work. I've seen it done beautifully. Um, I think, I think it's lovely when it happens, just something, maybe it's something I'm still working on, but something in me, just the, the item gives me anxiety. Cause I feel like I'm, I need to know what, like I'm supposed to know what it is. Um, and it also, my mind wants to start to infer information sometimes, which I don't like. I like to be really open and and not have any sort of um, like preconceived notion of, oh, this item belongs to a male or a female or a child or an old person or so, yeah, I don't need the items. Uh, and when I do have people bring in photos, if I want to hold the photo, I usually tell them to give it to me upside down because I don't want my mind creating details based on that person's photo, their appearance or what they're wearing or things in the photo. So I'll have them give the photo to me upside down. Um, if I'm going to work with a photo, some people like you to bring a photo. So I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I mean, if that's the way that they like to work and that's something you're comfortable with, um, yeah, I, I think it's, 
it's it's not totally uncommon. Um, and the other thing is sometimes if I'm if I'm working through a session and you know we've brought through a couple of their loved ones and and the session's moving along and I realize that we're you know maybe not running out of time but like I want to save time um, to make sure I I bring through or communicate with uh, people that they they really really need to hear from. Um, sometimes they will give me like a first name, for example, and the relationship to them. Um, usually it's already when we're all the way in the energy of it though. Uh, so I don't typically have people give me things like that ahead of time. Um, but some mediums will. So it's kind of a controversial thing. Some people will say like absolutely nothing. If they ask you for anything at all, they're not a real medium. I I don't know that that's true because I've seen people work you know, holding an item or holding a photo. I think those are fine ways to work. Um, yeah. So I think it's just personal choice and I think it's up to your discretion, but just that alone doesn't make someone a, a like a quote unquote good or a bad medium. There's just different ways of working. So it's important to let the medium work the way that they need to work also, because, you know, we're human beings as much as, you know, it, it might be easier if we could turn our humanness off when we're working. It's actually those emotions that need to be there for the communication. But sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes it can feel a little anxious in in the room, especially if you're feeling judged by the person in there. So um, we're human beings. We, ha- we Most mediums are trained. Hopefully you're seeing a good medium that's, that's trained and, and um, well-educated and all of that are trained to try to not let other people's emotions or attitudes or participation affect us. But the truth is it does uh, a little bit sometimes. So yeah, you shouldn't have to provide anything, but if, if the person's, you know, says they like to work with a photo or a, I mean, I know that there are astrologers, uh, specific types of astrologers and readers that do like face readings off of a photo of, of, um, a prospective partner, for example, and they'll do like a, an astrological face reading. Um, so there's lots of ways to work, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, that kind of leads into this next question, which is, um, what can I do to make it a good session? Does my energy or attitude matter for the session? So it's kind of what I was saying. Uh, yeah, it does. Um, I really now that I'm this far into my work, I really feel like in a lot of ways, it's a three, three part contribution for the mediumship communication. Um, it's the, the recipient or the, the group or the audience and it's me and it's the spirit world. So it's three, um, pillars of energy, if you will. And yes, it can still work if the person is, for example, skeptical or really closed off or not wanting to answer verbally or taking a long time to answer or um, there's lots of different types of sitters for lots of different types of reasons. So it can change the energy in the room. It doesn't mean it it won't work. Sometimes it does. On rare occasions, it doesn't work very well at all if that recipient either doesn't want to be there or doesn't have a need to be there. And it's just kind of like, yeah, I don't really, I don't really know. Um, it, it can change the dynamic in the room and it can change the energy of the session. It means the session won't go to where it could have gone if the energy was different. If that person was more open, if that person wanted to be there, if they were engaged, if they were, I like people to answer me verbally because sometimes I look off to the side a little bit. Um, if they're not answering me or if they're kind of fighting me over every little detail of something. Um, it, it just changes where it's going to go, but it can still work. So really the only remedy for that is just go in with an open heart and, you know, be yourself. And, and, um, the other little bit I'll add to this is it does help if you have a need to be there. So it's one thing to go to like an event, for example, like a, a demonstration, a group reading, if you're just curious and you just want to go, that's, that's one thing. But if you're going to go for a private reading, there should be a need to some degree, someone you just really need to hear from or um, a need in your own life. So maybe you're going through a transition or making a a big choice about a job or a life choice or, you know, anything, a relationship situation is going on in your life, or you're just wanting to um, understand your, your path, your spiritual path or 
something about you. But there should be like a need, kind of like we were talking about at the beginning with that little like nudging in the back of your mind type feeling, um, more than just a curiosity, like a casual curiosity. Um, I mean, we can still tell you some things about yourself, but it's just probably not going to go to the degree that it could if if there's not like a, an actual need within uh, the recipient. So that's a little bit I'll add to that. And the other bit is there's nothing you need to do to prepare the spirit world. You don't need to beg them to be there. You don't need to... Um, you know, you can bring items of theirs, like you'll often see, uh, especially on the televised shows, or if, if you watch other mediums, sometimes and I've had it too, where someone in the, in the audience will have things of that person in their purse or in their pocket, for example. Um, that's fine to do, but you don't need to do it to, to, some people are under this impression that they need to draw the loved ones in that way, um, or need to like extra beg them to come. I, I have had some instances and some other mediums share that if you put too much energy around that loved one, it almost sometimes makes the energy inaccessible around them. So, but the spirit world has an intelligence and, and they will communicate in the order they need to communicate. The medium's not really in control of that piece of it. Um, they know you're going, they're probably the one that got you there. So they, you don't need to do anything to like make certain that they're there. They, they will be there cause they know where you are. So they'll, they'll know it's time. Cause they, like I said, probably are the one that got you there, but if they didn't, uh, they know what you're up to. So you can think of them. You can, you can, you know, let them know you're excited to, you're excited to see what happens and to, to hear from them, but it's best if you can possibly manage it to be just open-minded about the experience. Cause again, every one works different. It's a mystical experience, which means it's this fleeting moment of, of experience in that mystical energy of the spirit world. It's, it's not something that could ever be recreated again. It's, it's unique in its totality. Um, it's such a special it's such a special and meaningful and sacred experience, really, that I, I just think sometimes we overlook that piece of it. So, yeah, just going in, you know, it's better if you can um, not have a ton going on and your phone blowing up like crazy. And it's good if you can just carve out that little bit of time for it, if you can be focused. Uh, but really, besides that, like, just be yourself, be open minded, be open hearted. There's nothing really else that you need to do, uh, which brings me to my next question. What questions should I ask a medium? Okay, this is a good question. Uh, and a lot of people ask this. So there's two ways you could go about this. You don't have to ask the medium anything, really. Um, but if you want to uh, kind of think of the things you'd like to hear about, the truth is a good medium will really be hoping to address the need, again, like we were talking about with the healing, um, you know, the, the healing or the need of the spirit side or the healing or the need of this side. It's kind of the same with this question. It's, it's the need that's really the truth of what's on your heart or on your soul or who needs to communicate with you from the other side that should be, you know, highlight in the session. Um, some people will, will make a little list of like, loved ones that they have just so they could be a little bit more top of mind of like, okay, yeah, I know who these people are, even though sometimes a loved one will come in that we forgot to put on the list or um, someone that we just didn't even consider could communicate. I always joke and say like, I've had third grade teachers kind of start off a group reading sometimes and it's not the person that they, you know, expected to come. So it could be a neighbor, it could be anyone. So you don't really need to necessarily make a list. Um, I typically don't uh, like take questions. So when someone sits down with me, really we don't go into their list of questions unless we're doing coaching. That's a little bit of a different thing than they're coming with an issue or a, a, you know questions to be coached on. But in a reading, um, typically I don't need them to come with questions, but uh, I sometimes later in the session will open up and ask if they have questions. It's just the way I work. Um, I was I was actually taught this by Mavis Patilla, and I won't do it all the time, but sometimes I will, and I, I let them know either I will have the answer or I won't, <laughs> and I will be really honest. I won't know the answers to everything. It's it should be about what we need to hear and not what we want to hear. So it's not about demanding information or 
um, you know, trying to get after something that's maybe just not an answer that our soul actually needs. It's maybe that our humanness wants it. Um, but yeah, so I, I sometimes will, depending on the reading, depending on the style of reading, what's going on, if we're working psychically in my recipient's energy and in their life, or if we're working with the spirit world, but I often will, um, I'm just thinking of one that I had just last week and we were looking at some job options. There were some job offers on the table and we were looking at, I was energetically, um, psychically or intuitively looking at the energy of each company, of each position, of the current teams around that position. So those are the type of things if someone's wanting to look at some different job options, for example. Um, and what I will do is like, so I worked in their career uh, part of their life in the psychic energy. And then I was wrapping that up and I was going to get ready. I was, the next thing I was becoming aware of is, okay, we need to talk about their, their relationship life next. Um, so sometimes as I'm pausing in a psychic reading and moving to the next area of their life, I might say, do you have any more questions in this area before I, I move into the energy of your relationships or into this next section? Um, so I sometimes then will ask if they have questions, but typically, really, if you're going in for a reading, you can kind of think about what's your intention for the session. Hopefully your intention will be, you know, to, to have the greatest, to have my need addressed, whatever that need is. But just keep in mind the need and the want aren't always the same. Sometimes they are, but not always. Sometimes what we need to, to hear or work on or know or who we need to hear from is, is not always the same as like what we want. Um, so yeah, you should be thinking more about what do you actually need, right? Um, and I think it's a little different if it's psychic versus mediumship because psychic, you know, typically you're going because there's a need happening. There's something going on in your life. You're trying to make a choice. Um, things are feeling stuck in some area. Things are not moving forward. There's a concern happening. So usually we kind of know what that need is. Um, and with mediumship, yeah, sometimes we think we know who we need to hear from and sometimes we are right and sometimes we're not. So it could be, for example, I'm thinking of another session that I had recently again about I've had a lot of career stuff lately again about um, this person's career life and what they were looking at doing and they were they really just wanted to hear um, their mom's opinion on the other side but it was actually their dad that came through first and wanted to give I think it was stepdad wanted to give some like business advice some, like practical career type um, advice and guidance so that was kind of interesting. Mom did also communicate, but it was it was interesting that like she thought she wanted to hear from her mom about this this job opportunity, um, different session. But it was actually the the stepdad who just had different uh, life experience in that area, and so wanted to come in and point out some things and highlight some things about my recipient when they were younger and, and some core qualities of them and and talk about this opportunity. So. Yeah, sometimes we think we know what we need and sometimes we're right and sometimes we're not. So you can you can bring questions if you'd like. Um, I always tell people if they do bring in a list of questions, I say like, hang on to that. Like, don't show it to me. Let me just work and then we'll see um, what naturally gets answered on that list. And then if if there are still questions you know, left over, like remaining, we can look at that then. So, and I would say 95% of the time, uh, all or like pretty close to all get get answered just as a natural part of that communication if it's part of the actual need. Um, okay, what is our next question? Let's see, scrolling down the list. What is an evidence-based medium? Okay, I told you I was going to talk about this. I just didn't realize it was this far down the list. So how we were talking about that there's different types of mediumship and even within the type of mediumship that deals with, like we were talking about in the first question, what's the purpose of mediumship, um, that deals with communicating with loved ones that have already crossed over to the spirit world. That's one type of mediumship, but even within that like topic of mediumship, there are still different types of mediumship communicating with the spirit world. The type I practice and I'm trained in is called evidential mediumship or evidence-based mediumship. And really, 
the way I explain it to my clients is what that means is when I'm communicating with your loved ones on the other side, I like them to share some specific details about themselves through the communication so you know it's them. <laughs> so it just means them sharing specific details about themselves. That Those details can come in like an endless amount of forms. Sometimes it has to do with their personality and, and who they were and types of things they would say. Sometimes it has to do with um, their character and who they were at their core as a person. Sometimes it has to do with quirky little things about them or uh, their job or their hobby or their, um, you know, it could be anything. It could be anything about them. Uh, once in a while, it's their name. For me, it's it's not often their name because the truth is, you know, our name is not the most significant thing about us. Um, and if I was communicating from the spirit world, I wouldn't just want to give my name. I would want to give something very specific about me so that that person knew like, oh, yeah, that's her, <laughs> not just my name. Um, I'm also not really attached to my name. So, uh, yeah, uh, those details that they share or that quote unquote evidence uh, really goes to show that, yes, this is them communicating. I don't know this information. This is not just me guessing. This is proof, quote unquote, or evidence uh, that your loved one is currently present in this communication, sharing these details so that it, so that you can know, shows that you can know that their soul is here and does continue on just in a different way, kind of like we were talking about the purpose of mediumship, which is why I like the evidence-based mediumship, because through those details, we really can know, oh yeah, this is this person. It might not be all the details we thought they would communicate or what we want them to talk about, but it, it almost always, I mean, this is the funny thing about when people feel like maybe a medium Googles them or like looks on their social media. Um, it First of all, I don't know any mediums that have time to do that or the desire to do that. I, I Not me uh, and not anyone I know. But the thing is the details that come forward or come through or are communicated are some of them probably you could, you could find, but the, the most of them and the, the best of them uh, are usually things that you couldn't, you can find about them with a fine tooth comb. Do you know what I mean? It's often little quirks about their personality or um, the way they cleaned their knickknacks or uh, little things about like their home or yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's in the small details, you know, and it's, I think we all kind of know that at our core that, the beautiful moments are not always the big moments. I mean, yeah, those are impactful moments sometimes, but the beautiful moments tend to be the quieter, softer, more intimate moments of our life. So often that's what they're sharing. Things that other people just wouldn't know, things that weren't shared publicly, um, little special details. So they are the best at, it's why I can't tell you like what those details would be because they're the best at knowing what those details are. Uh, it's funny. I, um, there's someone I'm thinking of in particular and in the communication, one of the things their loved one shared is I'm trying to get my name through to them in the world as a sign to say hello and to let them know that I'm safe and I'm okay. This person had a particularly, um, sudden and tragic passing. And they wanted their loved one to know like, Hey, I am giving you signs in the world. There's, they communicated to me. Yeah. This person wants me to send signs. They're asked, they want to know what I'm sending them and it's my name. And I said, you know, they're, they're communicating that you're really curious if they're sending you signs and why aren't they sending you signs? And they said, yeah, that's exactly right. And I said, you know, they are sending you signs and it's their name. And uh, I didn't know what that name was. It just wasn't part of the communication. But um, it's funny because the person, the sitter said, oh my gosh, can I tell you a little story about that? She's like, I, I know what it is. And I was like, okay. And she had recently um, 
moved into a new like area in her company, a new division. And the person that was in that role previously, she kept getting their um, notifications on the like some kind of like company wide internal messaging system or something because they were at the same post. Essentially, it the the messages came by um, based on the the location of like where their division was and the, where their the desk that they were at or whatever. So uh, the person that had had that desk number before her the messages kept coming and it was the loved one's name. It was the same name. (laughs) So um, they were like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what this is. And they, it, it was so funny to see their reaction because they were like, I was so annoyed by those messages coming thinking like, why isn't HR fixing this? Like, this is not their desk anymore. This is annoying. I, I don't want their messages. I didn't even put two and two together that that is my loved one's name. And that that could be, that that could be a sign from them. And I was like, oh yeah, they also are indicating that you have a tiny little picture of them on your desk, a tiny little, I didn't quite understand the way they were showing it to me, but just looked like the tiny, tiny little picture. And the person goes, oh yeah, I have a, a photo of them. That's on a little sticker. It came on like a sheet of stickers and it's a little sticker and it's on the corner of my um, screen, my computer screen at my desk. And it's a tiny little sticker. Uh, and I was like, well, there you go. So it's really amazing those little details that they'll choose to communicate to, to let you know that they're, that they're still there. Okay. So that is essentially what evidence means. And, and it's just a technical word that just designates that type of mediumship, which means, um, hopefully specific details of some kind will be involved so that you know that that's your person for sure. And the truth is, lots of people have very similar lives and personalities. And I always joke and say, I have several aunts. I have this like group of aunts on the other side and they're all very similar. They had similar lives. They kind of look similarly. They have a lot of similarities about their personality, their habits, uh, their quirks. A lot of them worked at the same place for a long time. So there's only very small details that could seem totally insignificant, but is the way I can tell them apart. Um, it's not always the same details even, but just like little little details that make this one different than that one, for example. So it's why I, one of the many reasons why I love the evidence-based Um Yeah. So that's essentially what evidential mediumship is. Uh, Can my loved one on the other side tell me my future? Okay. This is a really common question, y'all. I got to tell you. So the basic answer to this is no, but (laughs) I think everything is like a yes, but, or no, but, Um, you know, things are not so black and white. Can they tell the future? No, because it's not already decided for you. I don't think that we are just little puppets here with no free will and just going and marching through a course that was already pre-designed for us that, um, you know, has, has no variable. I believe that really the future unfolds as we make choices right now, the future unfolds. The the experience that we're experiencing right now is because of choices we made in the past where you live. It's because a different version of you chose to pick that place to live. So that's where you live right now. If you, this version of you today decided to, you know, rent a different place or buy a different place or live the van life, a future version of you will be sleeping in a van. So it's the decisions we make today that unfold our future for us. So in that way, I don't think that they are predicting our future for us because it's dependent on our free will choices. Now, that being said, I have heard stories from people that I believe (laughs) the stories of, um, of details of things like, uh, you know, I was just listening to a podcast uh, with, it was an interview with a medium called Alison Dubois. She's a famous medium. She that one of the uh, like medium shows was based on her life. I can't remember which one it was, but it was like one of the like crime crime ones, I think, um, like a like a drama series. Basically, uh, she's pretty well known. And she was saying in this story in this podcast that her someone came through to her when she was a I think a kid and told her to move her bed across the room. 
And she did it, but her family was like, what are you doing? Like, I think she was pretty young. Um, I'm butchering the story, but, and so they, she does, she moves her bed. And then the, the next day, I think it was, uh, a vehicle came crashing through that wall where her bed had been. So there are instances that people have shared like that, where, you know, it's just a couple days in the future, or it's just around the corner type of a thing. Um, typically, from what I have found, those types of quote unquote messages or information are delivered directly to the person. Uh, so I've heard others of like um, someone being shown in a dream, for example, like when something was going to happen in their life. Um, but it came right to them. This example where she was saying she just received a message in her mind about moving her bed or a voice told her or whatever it was, that came right to her. So it typically won't come through in a session. Um, I mean, I've even given, it's this is what's tough with prediction is it's so tied to our free will because if we choose not to do the thing, the thing's not going to happen. So, I mean, I've seen when I was very new in my work and, and was kind of still learning the rules and boundaries, I saw for a client, um, she wasn't sure if she was going to be able to have kids and it was a big concern. She had been in an accident and it was affecting everything and she was afraid. And um, I knew that about her, but I don't think I know how deep it was. I knew she was like newlywed at the time and that they were talking, you know, about maybe starting a family in the future. And I knew that she had, um, I was actually still a massage therapist at the time. So that's how I knew that she had some injuries, uh, in her body, particularly like her low back, her hips, like there had been some significant injuries from this accident. It was a really bad accident. Um, and I was, I think it might've been even like during a Reiki session that I was doing healing on her because she was seeing um, me for Reiki. I think I was doing a bit of massage with her in her neck and stuff. Um, and she was seeing some other practitioners for some different like acupuncture, different types of treatment like that. And in the Reiki session, I just would kind of open up my awareness for any guidance that might come through for them. And I saw a quick flash of a, of a little scene um, of her, I knew the age that she was in the scene and I knew that there was a little girl, it was her little girl. And I could kind of describe the little girl a little bit. Uh, and I told her afterwards, I said, this is just what I saw. So I, I, I do believe that you're going to be a mom when you're ready. And I told her the age. Well, a few years later, I hadn't heard from her for, we just lost touch. And I think her, um, the, the amount of treatment she was allowed to have ended. And so whatever happened and I, we just lost touch. And, and she emailed me and said like, you know, I, I had my daughter at this age and this is what she looks like. I think I was telling her she, she would have big blue eyes. Um, and she does. <laughs> so that happened, but I mean, they chose to also to try to have a baby. So um, and they chose to bring that child into the world and that pregnancy was successful. So all the things lined up and they put free will choice into that. So it can happen. But again, I don't think that was from a spirit person. I think I saw that in the energy of her soul. So typically your loved ones are not going to tell you the future because the future doesn't exist yet. They're not going to tell you details that are yours to live and unfold. Because then you wouldn't know if it happened because they said that you were going to choose that or because you chose that. Um but once in a while, little bits of details can come through. And the other thing to know is sometimes when a medium or a psychic, sometimes when we get information, whether it's from the soul of the person we're talking about or whether if it's from the soul of a loved one on the other side, we don't always know the exact timeline. So we might see something in the potential for that person's soul in this lifetime, but we might not know when it's going to happen. So we might be aware of something in someone's potential and it doesn't happen in their life for another 15 years, 10 years, for example. Um, that's not ideal, but it, it can happen. I had, when I was very young, I saw, I think like a tar palm reader, a tarot card reader, and I, I can't even remember what the prediction was, but they made a prediction that did come true for me later. Um, it was pretty random and pretty specific, uh, but I can't, I can't even remember what it was now, but um so that can happen too. It's it might not always be 
you know, sometimes with our free will choice, things move on the timeline. So something might be available to us, but then we make these choices over here and the things that were on the other side get pushed down the line a little bit. Does that make sense? Um, like for example, if you have the potential in your soul to be a physician's assistant, let's just say, um, you know, medical doctor, all of that, uh, and you decide instead that you really love, uh, you know, building homes for other people. So for a while, you decide to travel the world and be a part of a program that builds homes for people. Well, <laughs> That's what you're doing for that period of time. And then, you know, life leads you around and you realize, oh, I can help these people in a different way um, by offering them medical care. And so you decide to go to medical school and get your PA or your, you know, MD or whatever it is that you decide to get. Uh, it's just a different place on your timeline. You could have chosen to do it sooner. You could have chosen to do it instead of going around the world and building the houses, but you chose to do that. And so then that thing that's, available to you just loops back around at a different point in the timeline when your soul chooses it, when you're ready. So yeah, that's my, also my little timeline addition on, uh, you know, can, can we know the future? Uh, this question we kind of touched on recently, I think, and if you guys want to talk more about it, we can, uh, it's not my specialty, but it's, do you believe in past lives? Yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> I do believe in past lives. Um, I don't typically do that type of work with clients though. I'll tell you that I will occasionally do it with like advanced students, uh, if that's something we're working on, but I don't typically do it with clients. Um, because of the way that I do that work, I feel like I do it more experiential for the person that I'm doing it with. So it's more of a guided experience the way I do it with people. So they would need to be at a certain level to be able to have that experience. Um, so yeah, so I believe in past lives. I feel like I've seen and experienced details about other people's past lives and about some of my own, probably not about all of them. Uh, this is, you know, we can all believe whatever we choose to believe. So you don't have to agree with me on this. And one day I think we will all get to know the truth of this. Um, I, I will say it's, if you go back to the the one, two, skip a few episode about reincarnation and past lives. I really went into it in that one and talked about, you know, do I think we reincarnate? Yes. I think we have a choice. Um, I think we wait to see everyone who would want to see us before we reincarnate. Uh, and I do believe that we have past lives. I, I don't know if everybody has them. I think there's maybe there are some people that first time here, <laughs> but in that episode, I also go into detail about like how I believe we, this is not the only place we can come to learn. So that's my answer for that. Um, are we bothering loved ones, guides, et cetera, when we are calling on them? That's a great question. No, you're not bothering them. So the way I understand it from the loved ones on the other side and from people that have experienced near-death experiences, once we are not confined, once this energy, this part of our soul is not confined in this physical body, which limits us to being one place at a time, right? As a human being, we can only be one place at a time. Many of us would like to be more than one place at a time, and we can't. Once we're not limited in this container of our physical body, we could be more than one place at a time. So it's why you know, your loved one can be with you at home and with your kiddo at school and with, you know, your parent at home, you know what I mean? So it's, they can be many places at once. So you're not bothering them because they could be many places at once with guides. If it's a guide that's assigned to you, you're definitely not bothering them because they're assigned to you. If it's, for example, like an archangel that everyone can access, they are able to to have enough energy and enough space and time to be able to help everyone simultaneously if they wanted to or needed to. So you're not bothering them. You can call on them anytime, night or day. You're not taking them away from something else they need to be doing. They could be doing other things and you know they can also be with you as a soul. Um, so yeah, you're not bothering them. Call away, call, call on them. Uh, they can show you signs and, and be present with you, whether the presence is so subtle that you might not be able to feel like you're sensing it. That's a different story, but you're not bothering them. Uh, this final question. 
Okay, we're going to go into this. This is an interesting question. I've been I've been talking about this kind of a lot lately and I haven't talked about it for a long time. What is a symbol library and do you think mediums should have them? Okay. This question is from someone who's clearly <laughs> starting to develop their mediumship. So congratulations to the author of this question. I think I've gotten it a few different times. Um, and for those of you that have spiritual gifts, if you have questions, I mean, I don't have all the answers. I probably should have said this at the top of the episode, my little disclaimer. I don't have all the answers, of course, and I'm still learning as well. And I will never know all of the things, but I'm happy to talk about these things or share with you the bits I have learned. And you can see if you agree or if it resonates with you or not. Um, so if you're developing medium or you feel like you have some gifts, even if you're at the very start of it, if you want to write in questions, um, I, I've been in this work a number of years at this point. So I know some stuff. I don't know all the stuff, but I know some stuff. So you can write in uh, these types of questions and ask them. We can do a whole nother ask a medium on that if you if there's enough questions. So feel free. What is a symbol library? A symbol library is it's kind of an old fashioned way of working. Um, and not all older mediums work this way, but it is a bit of an old fashioned thing. I hope this is not taught anymore. I don't know that it is. Uh, maybe it is. Uh, so a symbol library is essentially just like it sounds. It's the individual worker, medium or psychic, assigning meanings to symbols. And it, it doesn't always, I mean, it could be a symbol like a letter or a number. It could also be a symbol like a purse or a plant or a yellow rose or a, I don't know, sprinkler. It could be anything. Um, and they, they assign different meanings to these different symbols so that when they're working with the spirit world or when they're working in your energy, for example, if the spirit person communicates that symbol to them, you would hear them say something like, oh, they're showing me a, they're showing me a gold ring. That's my symbol for engaged. Or are you engaged to this person? Okay. <laughs> it is one way of working. There are lots of different ways of working. I'm not throwing shade on the way anyone else works. Uh, there was a time where I was told by a teacher to make a symbol library. So perhaps this is still being taught. It was a number of years ago. Um, here is why I don't believe in that now. Here is why I don't personally do that. This again is Andy Bing, who you guys know I love and we will have on the show one day. Um, he's my mentor. He has this amazing explanation. And I, I'm not saying he's the only medium that explains it this way, but he's the one I heard this from. So the way he explains it is when we have a symbol library as a medium, we are putting so many limitations on the spirit world and on how they can communicate certain things to us. For example, this is not his example. Uh, I really want to use his example, but I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it with the gold ring one. Um, for example, in, in the one with the gold ring where that would symbolize engagement. Well, the obvious one is what if they weren't engaged? What if they were married? Um, so, but that's a pretty close meaning. But what if they're not trying to show you engaged? What if they want to use that gold ring to show you that, you know, you have that person's gold ring tucked in your jewelry box, or you have that person's gold ring and you wear it around your neck. It could be that. Or what if they make gold rings? What if they're a jeweler or a, um, a metal smith, I think is the correct term. Uh, what if they, you know, had a booth at all the craft fairs and that's what they did is they made these really special gold bands, gold, you know, gold rings. And that's, that's what they did. Uh, what if they collected gold rings and they want to talk about what happened to their collection? So it's so limiting when we make a specific object mean only one thing. It's like, you know, it's just so, so limiting in the way they can communicate. And I have learned that that all the spirit people communicate just a little bit differently. So for some spirit communicators, I may re receive many more mental pictures for others, I might feel much more in the emotion. For others, I might hear more audibly inside my mind than, than another. So uh, we really want to be able to let them access and use whatever they need to use to get us to talk about whatever it is that they want to talk about. Um, 
there are just, I, I'm like hesitating because I really, I'm just going to use, I think this is the example that Andy taught this with. Uh, I found it in my own mediumship, which is why I'm struggling. So this is the actual example I have. He used the example of like a red rose. And he said, you know, if you, for example, uh, say red rose is for anniversary, let's just say. And I, red rose always symbolizes anniversary. That's my symbol for anniversary. And then you have a spirit communicator who, uh, for example, grew these beautiful red roses and every year they took first place at the county fair. Um, well, you're going to say anniversary as the medium and you're going to get a no, it's going to be wrong because it's not about that. If you, if you didn't have that as a symbol and you received the red rose, you could work with the emotion that's there and possibly understand the story of that person's prized roses, or at least you would be available for that story. I had it, I've had a few of these recently, some with roses and some with other flowers and plants. <laughs> um, but I had one recently that was uh, a person and they actually inherited a property from their loved one on the other side. And that loved one had these really special roses that they were very proud of and very obsessed with. And um, so they were showing me that some of those roses were no longer there. And then they were showing me that there was one that made this very specific, um, really velvety color that was aromatic that also made the smell um, and made these really big, beautiful blooms. And that one was still there and that one still gave flowers. So if I just only understood red rose for anniversary, I would have missed that. And I've actually had red rose represent anniversary in a communication before when they were showing me these red roses and I was understanding in the emotion, oh, this person is giving them to his wife. This is for a special occasion. This is only for anniversaries, birthdays, you know, the big occasions that they give these roses. And then, you know, the person said yes. And then I kept working. And as I was working, the next thing I became aware of was, oh, and he grows these roses himself. So these are his roses that he tends to and grows and spends so much time and energy on. And these are the roses. He goes out and cuts them specially because the birthday is actually around the time that the roses bloom. So that's why. Um, and the anniversary also was like around that, you know, a very similar time when there was still roses blooming. So that was why. So I would have missed that extra layer to the story that this person was wanting to share if I just stopped at, oh, roses anniversary. Um, so it's really interesting. And it's, it's part of the frustration and the magic of this work is that it's different every time, but it's different every time. <laughs> so there's, it's. I know that it might seem like a natural, like, oh yeah, we could do this a little quicker if we could do like charade style symbols for everything. Um, but then we're missing so much in the detail. So that is my understanding of, of uh, symbol library. It's why I don't personally use them. Now, that being said, that's me as a medium, as a, in my work as a medium. Me as a human, Joy, my, my personal self outside of my work, I have symbols for things, for sure, but just not in my work. Because when it's me having the symbol, it's me asking the universe, show me this sign when, um, you know, or if I need a sign about something, I'll say, you know, show me this sign to let me know that this is in alignment, that I'm correct, that this is the direction to move with this choice. Um, then I'm using symbols because it's about me from either my guide or the universe or my soul or whatever, um, or my loved ones. And it's not me applying it to every spirit person I ever communicate with. It's because that would limit their story, their ability to communicate, their healing perhaps. Uh, and it would limit the communication from going to where it could and I'm trying to do my best. <laughs> so I don't want to limit it certainly in any way if possible. Um, so yeah, in my private personal life and work, uh, I do use symbols. So you could use them privately for yourself. And if you're a person who's not a medium or not doing spiritual work in any way, use symbols. Uh, like use them as signs for things for yourself. Sure, why not? Um, it just as a medium, 
the way Andy explained it just really made so much sense to me. And like I said, before that, I, there were, I've heard people saying make, make a library. Uh, so I think it's just a really wise decision in your mediumship not to. Now that's not to say like when I read tarot cards, for example, in the weekly readings, you guys might hear me say, oh, in this card, you know, in the traditional Rider Waite deck, this symbol symbolize like pomegranates symbolize abundance and fertility. Um, that's the way that deck is designed, but there are other symbols and meanings and so many. So in certain areas of work, yeah, it makes sense that there are certain symbols that mean certain things. In other areas of work, more in the like reading space when you're communicating with the spirit world who have their own unique lives and stories and uh, emotions and things they want to share. In that area, I just find it, I, I really lean into Andy's explanation and why it's counterproductive. So I hope that makes sense. Well, we have gotten through a lot of questions. I hope that this has piqued your interest. I hope that you have maybe learned a little something or have something to think about now. Um, again, we have the community healings every month. The rest of the year is up and soon I'm sure I will have next year up. I'm trying to get ahead of things. So check out the website, joyfulmedium.com and look in the events section for the free community healings. Um, I've kind of been thinking about maybe also putting the weekly readings on the podcast. This isn't the format I record them in. So I'm a little on the fence because the way I record them, you guys, if you guys have seen them, I just do them in the office and usually I can record them out a little bit. So um, I'm just thinking about it. I, and they're, they're short. They're under 10 minutes usually. So let me know if you guys would like those here on Friday. Uh, I know a lot of you already get them on social media or if you're on my email VIP list. You get them right in your inbox so you don't even have to go looking for them. If you sign up for the free community healings, you will be added to that list automatically. So um, if you want the weekly readings to come to your inbox, uh, just get on my email list on the website. Um, but yeah, let me know your thoughts on that. And thanks for being here with me today. Keep the questions coming. I love them. Uh, like I said, I don't have all the answers. I'm always still learning myself, but I'm happy to share everything I know. And that's why we're here together in Spirit Speakeasy to talk about all of these things. So I hope that you are settling into your September. Uh, if you have been watching the weekly readings, you know that there's a good possibility we're about to hit another patch of pivots. Um, so I hope that everything is well in your world. I am so grateful for you being here. I would love it if you would like and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening. Uh, it helps the pod. Um, and I'm so excited to see you next week. We have, like I said, I'm, I'm ahead a little bit right now, except for my episodes. So we have some really exciting episodes coming up uh, through the fall. So I'm really excited to share these guests with you, their stories. I'm excited to share some more of our solo episodes. I've got some really fun things coming up and I am really grateful for you as we head into the final third of 2024. Big hugs, lots of love. Bye for now from inside Spirit Speakeasy.